Good evening. I'm Stanton Hudson, the executive director of the Theodore Roosevelt uh, inaugural site. Uh, and I'd like to welcome you all to uh, speaker night at the site. Uh, and uh, we're welcoming you all in person, but we're also welcoming uh, a group of folks who are joining us tonight remotely. Um, this evening's program uh, is on a very relevant topic in today's world and was and is an issue that was as challenging during TR's presidency, what was that, 123 years ago, as it is today for Americans and our elected leaders. On display across the hall in our exhibit room is an exhibit entitled Immigration and American Story about the history of immigration in the United States. If you haven't taken the time yet to see it, please check it out before you leave here this evening or stop in any time during the month of March uh, to visit it. We're very happy to have Jennifer Rizzo Joy with us this evening to present Immigration Will Always Be an American Story. Jennifer is the Executive Director of the International Institute of Buffalo. She is currently leading that organization through an internal growth phase, while at the same time, she and her team are dealing with the challenges of increasing numbers of clients seeking International Institute services. This increase is due in no small part to major humanitarian crises throughout the world. Jennifer served as legal director for Journeys End in Buffalo, launching that organization's legal aid program, raising more than a million dollars from new grant lines, establishing a walk-in clinic, and hiring and leading a team that handled more than 500 immigration legal cases a year. She has also worked at Human Rights First in Washington, D.C., where she developed and led a national pro bono program to expand legal representation for immigrants around the country, working closely with the Obama White House and establishing field offices and coalitions in Texas, Louisiana, and Georgia. Jennifer Rizzo Choi earned her MBA from MIT's Sloan School of Management and her Juris Doctor from the University at Buffalo School of Law. Please note that after the presentation, we'll, we will have a Q&A session. Those attending remotely by Zoom Please use the chat box to place your questions. We will read them out loud for the audience here at the TR site. Those in person can raise their hand and of course, ask the questions of Jennifer directly. Jennifer, we now turn the program over to you. Thank you, everybody. It's uh, great to be here. Um, we are excited to share more about the International Institute and our mission, uh, as well as talk about immigration being an American story. Um, it's really the uniquely American story because almost all of us come from somewhere else. Um, so um, you've heard my background. I would say I'm pretty much a immigration lawyer who used to be a TV news reporter. That's like the short version of of my life. Um, the Institute has been part of my world for at least the last decade. Um, and of course, part of our Buffalo community for some time. It was founded in 1918, um, initially as part of a program of the YWCA. Um, it was meant at the time to accept and help war brides of the World War I soldiers that had gone 
overseas um, and had married a foreign girl and brought her back here and she needed to learn English and was looking for some community. And um, over the years, we we moved into doing classes like English classes, foreign language classes, cooking classes, cultural gatherings, and of course, uh, formal services as well. Um, I'll hit through those services quickly just so you have some familiarity with our organization um, and what we look like present day before we sort of skip back to talking about immigration during TR's time. Um, so today, the Institute's core services um, include refugee resettlement. That is established funding that comes through the U.S. government, through the State Department. Um, it uh, involves bringing people in here who have fled their homeland and after waiting time and going through a process that we can talk about later, um, they come here and they begin their new chapter of their lives here in Buffalo. And so we are, we do core social services. We find them an apartment, we get them a job, we get their kids in school, we get their life moving. Um, we are one of four agencies in this town that do that work. Um, a fifth agency being Jericho Road also serves refugees. They do medical services. They have a community health center, but the the five of us, we refer to as the five families. Um, our official consortium that we all belong to is called the Refugee Partnership, and we work in concert. And it's quite frankly the reason why Buffalo has been made better. We have had um, a huge increase in population in the last 20 years due to refugee resettlement. Um, our unique selling proposition is um, out of those four agencies is that we've been doing this the longest. We are non-sectarian. We're the only agency that does not have a religious affiliation. Um, the kind of work that we do, we continue to do a lot of cultural work. Um, we have specific programming. Um, our employment program is specialized. Um, and we have a large cultural impact due to our unique tie-in with the ethnic communities. Um, so I talked about case management, employment services. We are booming. We are, um, we are resettling 350 refugees this year. We put over... 200 people through our job club last year, and we have a 95% placement rate with our job club. Um, and that's not counting the hundreds of other clients that are coming to us for other services. We also run a small business. So in case you feel inspired to try out your, find out your own immigration story after this, and you find documents you want translated, we can offer that service. We provide interpreters in over hundred languages in person. Um, or online or on video, on video or phone. Um, and we serve the community in that way. We've got contracts with the courts, the schools, uh, hospitals, et cetera. And that's to help with integration, which has always been a big part of our core mission. We also believe strongly in education and in cultural understanding. And in doing that, there's um, an important hook in that we host Model UN. Um, we've been running that for over 30 years. Um, it's a great way to tap into the young kids and get them to be aware of the globe and the planet that they are a part of. And this year's Model UN is actually going to take place in three weeks at UB. There are over 800 high school students registered. This is our most ever. I know it's super cool. Um, there's a lot to discuss in global politics today. So, and they get to pick the topic. Um, and it's a great way to get kids early on understanding that this is an interconnected world. We also um, offer cultural competency trainings, and that's to talk to employers, to businesses, to hospitals, doctors, people that interact with foreign-born people here with refugees and, and have their staff learn about what people have gone through, the cultural nuances um, in terms of respect and customs. Um, and so your business can hire us. Um, the Rotary Club can hire us. We, we're willing to go out and do those, those trainings and sessions. The last core program that we offer is survivor support services. Um, unfortunately, uh, sometimes immigrants are victimized. They are a vulnerable population because they're new here. And um, we see unfortunate things happening with people um, in, in the terms of domestic violence and human trafficking. And so we do the same case management for them that we do for refugees. And we also support them through the criminal justice process. So they have an advocate to go into court with. We help them get an order of protection. We have people who can talk to them in their own language or we bring interpreters in to help. Um, that's a very intimate service that requires building of trust. And we've been doing that for the last 20 years as well. So that's a little bit about the Institute and about me. Um, immigration and an American story is what we're here to discuss today. And um, 
I love the theme, which is that immigration will always be an American story. That's so true because our, our nation has always been made up of people arriving here. Um, I want to talk today a bit to dispel some of the myths that have persisted over time up to present about um, negative things that are said about immigrants. Um, want to underscore the impact that new Americans have made in our community and in the economy and how that adds to our diversity, vibrancy, and growth, um, all of which are really good things. So um, if we take a look back, well, we look today at the 2020 census. Um, that's our most recent census where um, only 1.1% of people surveyed are actually born in indigenous to the United States. That means that almost 99% of people came from somewhere else, my family included. And that also includes uh, President Roosevelt's family. So um, taking a little look at uh, Teddy Roosevelt, of course, he was born in New York City. Um, so he's a true New Yorker, born in 1858, and he was president during the years of 1901 to 1909. Um, his family's immigration story is that they came via the Netherlands. Um, and it, it hails back quite a way to the 1640s. Um, he had an autobiography that he wrote where he talked about his family, his family's voyage over, and he equated that to the immigrants that were coming over during his days when he was president, because that was, of course, the boomtown days of Ellis Island and all those arrivals and the black and white footage we see on TV today. Um, his family settled in New Amsterdam, um, which is sort of an area of New York State, sort of in Manhattan area, but tracing his lineage back to Dutch roots, um, Pilgrims, Welsh, and English Quakers, he's pretty much a European mix, which is common that you find with lots of folks today. Um, so he was well aware of the fact that his folks came from somewhere else. Um, interesting fact about President Roosevelt is in uh, 1912, when he was shot, um, he was actually shot by an immigrant. He was campaigning at the time for his Bull Moose presidency. And um, the immigrant was a paranoid German immigrant who um, shot at him. He was, that immigrant was actually disarmed by another immigrant, a Czech immigrant. And um, Teddy Roosevelt was saved because his eyeglasses case prevented the bullet from entering his heart. He had a copy of his speech and his eyeglasses case in his pocket and um, it protected him. Um, and it did not seem to turn his sentiment at all against immigrants um, and that particular um, that particular immigrant uh, that was charged ended up being found not guilty for reasons of insanity. Incidentally, it's a very hard criminal defense to win if you take crim law, but I guess he must have had a good lawyer back then. Um, so back before Teddy Roosevelt's time, the law of the land, um, there wasn't a ton of changes. It, it was settled in 1790, which is called um, the Nationality Act or the Naturalization Act of 1790. Um, and it went through um, who they were willing to accept as a citizen. And there's a couple of key points in here that I'll bring up because um, some of them continue as themes through today. So back then, you had to be a free white person. That was pretty settled and clear. Um, they also were willing to give you citizenship after two years. That's not highlighted in yellow, but it's in like the fourth line. And that's interesting because today you need to have residency for five years. And it's not five years upon arrival. It's five years after you get your green card that you begin your count. I spend a lot of time talking to clients about when the clock begins. <laughs> and the other thing that's interesting in this um, act that has continued through time um, is being a person of good character. So that was the language back then. Today, the language is good moral character or GMC is what we call it in like law school circles. Um, it means that you can't have arrests or convictions. Um, you can't have been disreputable. Um, you can't have illegally voted. Um, there's a host of things that we look at and people go through a very in-depth questioning when they go through the process to become a citizen of our country. It's actually not easy to become a citizen. Um, and it also shows you back then that there was already an established viewpoint in place that we only want certain kinds of people. That was the thought process, right, on immigrants. It's always been a continuing theme. We only want certain people in. And so um, as we move forward in time, as immigration continued to this country, we started to see legislation put through into law that was excluding certain kinds of people. They only wanted certain kinds of immigrants coming. 
Um, and, you know, as one would say, the, the law of the land is written by the people who are in the majority, right? And so those in the majority um, designed the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. Um, it was, um, it was uh, the first federal law that excluded people from entering the country based on race alone, race or ethnicity. Um, and this law was actually re renewed and expanded over time. It was finally repealed in 1943, which is interesting because we were in the middle of World War II at the time. Um, at the time that the act was put into effect, uh, Chinese immigrants had already begun settling in Buffalo in the late 1890s. Um, by about the 1900 census, there were 97 Chinese immigrants living in Erie County. And many of them were the first people who established Chinese laundromats and restaurants, primarily in the Michigan Avenue, Oak Street, and William Street area. So you can see from the, the sign that we have a, a arrow pointing here about notice that they did not want communists, nihilists, socialists, Feeney, and, and hoodlum are welcome, but no admittance to the Chinamen. And um, that's a political cartoon, you know, put out at the time. So um, following on the heels of the Chinese Exclusion Act was the Geary Act. In 1892, um, again, it's even more severe. It was um, uh, looking at requiring um, all Chinese people in America to register. Um, this is a common thing that happens in many countries that are looking at immigration waves where they want to know who is here and where everybody is. Um, you had to have this certificate of residence and carry it with you at all times. Um, and those without the proper paperwork or witnesses to their authenticity could be deported. And that that's similar theme today, um, where immigrants may be stopped, especially in the southern states. Um, we have a 25-mile um, area that's recognized by the Border Patrol and our national laws that says that they're allowed to stop and question, um, and they expect to understand and see if you have proof of being here. So that's because our national defense is considered at its highest point at border. So border being land border and also airport. You all have to show your papers when you go to the airport, especially if you're leaving the country, right? So um, it continued on forward in that these things were going into place when um, President Roosevelt was elected in 1901. This is his um, one of his famous portraits that was done in 1903. If you look at that time and you reflect back from about 1880 to 1940, over 650,000 immigrants a year were arriving from Europe. 650,000 a year, huge population boom for the economy, for the country and the economy. Um, they were mostly coming from Southern and Eastern European areas, and they were here and finding factory jobs, largely in Northeastern cities and Midwestern cities. So we're talking about the Italians, the Polish and other uh, Eastern Europeans. Um, so 15 million came in that 15 year window. A lot of growth at that time. During the Roosevelt presidency, um, there was uh, a series of acts that went into place that were looking at, again, being more specific um, about who they wanted to get rid of, who was allowed to stay. Um, the Anarchist Exclusion Act of 1903 was the first time the political beliefs had been added to the list of disqualifications for immigration. I'm guessing that came on the heels of an assassination that happened in Buffalo. Um, you know, again, Congress looking at trying to be more specific and ask questions. This was still at a time, though, that people were coming through ports like Ellis Island, where, yeah, there was an inspector there, but there wasn't a fingerprinting there. You know, back then, the inspections were looking for um, lice, and there was a big focus on the eyes and eye disease, and they wanted to make sure people were healthy. Um, and they might call you in for questioning, but it, it wasn't the, the full background check and works that are done for folks today. Um, so we have this series of events in 1903, the Naturalization Act in 1906, the Immigration Act of 1907, and the Expatriate Act of 1907 as well. The Nats Act of 1906 created uh, what was then called the Bureau of Immigration and Naturalization, or referred to as the INS which has existed up until 9-11 when George Bush stepped in and redesigned and took the entire INS, broke it up, and created what is now called the Department of Homeland Security, DHS. But INS existed for 100 years. And when you uh, read old cases on immigration, it's always like have like today in law, I was teaching a class today at the law school and it was Pavlova v. INS. Like 
um, you know, whatever other foreign name, V INS. So the INS existed for 100 years until um, DHS was born. Um, the Immigration Act of 1907 added more categories of unfit people. It banned the mentally and physically disabled to the list of those banned from immigration. Um, the Expatriation Act of 1907, fascinating, that required women to adopt the citizenship of their husbands. So they were American-born women, and they were forced to renounce their U.S. citizenship if they married a man who was not American or U.S. citizen. Um, all of this going on um, sort of in the shadow of the place. Um, you know, this is the same time frame that Mother Cabrini um, started to focus on and be looking at coming to America as well. And that movie actually is coming out next week. Um, super exciting. I just watched the trailer today with my law school class. And, um, you know, she was asked to come here and work in the slums of New York and work with the Italian immigrants specifically. So this was a time where it was very clear if you were a preferred group of individuals or a not desirable group of individuals. So then we move forward to the Gentleman's Agreement oops, of 1907. And that was where President Roosevelt at the time forced San Francisco to repeal its Japanese American school segregation order. So Chinese students were already segregated at that time. Um, but he intervened on behalf of Japanese and ex in an exchange for Japan agreeing to deny immigration passports to Japanese laborers, the U.S. would still allow in wives, children, and parents of current immigrants to enter the United States. So many Japanese and Korean women at the time utilized this specific provision to immigrate here as what was called picture brides, um, and they were marrying Japanese men that they only knew through an exchange of photographs. Um, and so this may seem super bizarre that this like one area of law was created, but it's actually a common theme in immigration law where like something is carved out to protect a certain group of people, but then everybody else falls into this other category. Um, and that really goes to the sentiment at the time and who was in Congress at the time and, and you know, where public sentiment was in order. Um, so in this particular case, Japanese immigrants were able to establish an equitable gender ratio in their community here in America, but obviously not the same case for the Chinese community. So heading into World War I, TR has exited the White House at this point. Of course, World War I, you know, going on from 1914 to 1918. Um, and the Immigration Act of 1917 established a literacy requirement for immigrants who are entering the country. So not a literacy requirement to become a U.S. citizen, but a literacy requirement for those entering the country. And it also halted immigration for most Asian countries. So the literacy requirement exists today. It's enduring, not for entry though. It's it's in place for citizenship. So um, to become a citizen after you have specific things you have to have, we talked about five years, good moral character. Um, you gotta show that you've paid taxes. Um, you have to have a whole address history and everything answer. I think the application is now 14 pages long. When I started practicing law, it was like six pages long and they just keep adding questions. It makes the legal aid appointment take a whole lot longer to get through. Um, but, you know, your client has to be able to go into that room and pass the test. And the um, test is based on civics, as well as um, the ability to interact in English. So the entire interview happens in English. They want you to be able to spell and write. Um, and then you also are quizzed on um, civics facts, and you're given, there's a list of 100 questions, and they can pop quiz you on 10, and you need to get at least six to pass. Now, there is a movement that's been worked on within the government to redo the citizenship exam. Um, and I'm not sure what the status is of that. It was being looked at during the Obama years and then the, during the Trump, Trump presidency, they were going to um, make it extremely hard. And I now the Biden administration now has a, a task force that's looking at doing it because it's a recitation of facts. And usually what they do is they ask you like three softballs, like who's the current president? Who was our first president? Then they'll ask you something random about like how large the Supreme Court was in, you know, 1810. And, you know, yeah. And it, there are questions that you would not know unless you were a U.S. history teacher. You know, you might have known when you were in, you know, seventh grade, but you wouldn't know uh, today. So literacy being an intention by our government that we want people to be able to converse in the, the national language of English. Um, but also I'd say on the on the positive side of this is it's an intention and integration. 
making sure that folks who are here and are being settled in, if they to have five years to be here and become a resident and get settled in, the aspiration is that they would learn English and be able to converse. And between when they arrive and then, um, the International Institute and organizations like ours are here to help you, right? We're there to have an interpreter at your doctor's appointment. We are there to um, help you go to the DMV to get your first photo ID and help you get your bank account set up. So um, there is an expectation that people be able to, you know, pull up their bootstraps and help themselves, but not on day one. Um, and so that's where I think nonprofits and charities like ours have stepped in over the years to help fill that gap. Um, and of course, at this time, as we were being involved in World War I, the Institute started turned into formation. We ended up um, forming as a program in 1918 and then uh, incorporating in 1924. So I put this um, slide in here because I thought I'd just drop this as a point in. Um, this My family's immigration story interweaves with this as well at this time. Um, we're now up to the 1920s. We have a very typical, my grandfather's side, my Italian side is Rizzo, is how we pronounce it, Rizzo. Um, in 1912 was when my great grandfather came over and he worked in the coal mines in Pennsylvania. And this middle document is the passenger manifest because he came through Ellis Island like pretty much everybody else did. Um, and he worked hard, saved money, sent it back to Sicily and, and was going back and forth to Sicily um, to meet his wife, uh, Rosa, Rosalia, who's in the picture. And um, at some point uh, after they married and they had three kids, uh, Rosa and her three children boarded a ship to come here. And that's the ship, that's the SS Giuseppe Verdi. Um, and they came across in 1927. So my grandfather is the oldest there with the little curly cue on his front forehead. Um, and those are his brothers. Uh, so his name is also Gaspare, Jasper, um, and, and sort of the westernized version, but Gaspare. And then he had Alfonso and, um, uh, Alfonso, and who was it? And Sal, Salvatore. And so all three came and I always marvel at this photo because I have three children, uh, my great grandmother's age. Uh, my grandpa was six or seven on the boat and he remembers the boat journey. And so um, he's, he's passed now, but I asked him lots of questions about this, especially as I became an immigration lawyer. And he had stories of remembering screwing around in the bottom of the deck. And they apparently like, because they were on that ship for two weeks. They went underneath like the latrine section and they were like screwing around and like somebody latched it accidentally and they got stuck. It was a terrifying memory that he remembered. Um, but he remembers the boat being rocky um, and, you know, and the baby was young. And so I have no idea how Rosalia managed to do this for two weeks because my children fight when we go on a car ride that lasts an hour long to Rochester. And there's no iPad to bribe them. So I I don't even know how they did two weeks on this ship. But, um, you know, everybody has this story to some extent. Maybe not the Italian journey, but, you know, there through our archives, you can request this information if you join genealogy sites. Um, I got these documents from a combination of paperwork in his basement. Um, I did a FOIA for the manifest and then Google Images to find the boat. You know, there's just a trove of information where you can trace back your lineage. And I just, I find it so fascinating. Um, so, you know, in that context, right after um, World War War ends, we have the Immigration Act of 1924. And now we're starting to see quotas. So at this point, um, that act limits the number of immigrants that are yearly allowed in through nationality. And specifically, they didn't want immigration visas to account for no more than 2% of the, of the visas per year. So they didn't want to have, they didn't want to become another little Italy or another little Ireland. Um, and this is also a common thing that happens, not just in our country, but in other countries where they want to limit, they feel that there's too many people taking over of a group, right? Um, and so it's interesting because the quota system exists today as well. It's just that it's no longer 2% of visas, it's now like 7%. No more than 7% of visas handed out can come from any one nationality. And so if you ever hear of somebody saying, well, I filed for my brother or mother or whatever, and, and I'm still waiting, and they said it's going to be 20 years, well, that's why. Because there's 20 years of people waiting on the list to come from the Philippines or from Mexico for a sponsored visa through family immigration. That's why there's a quota. Um, 
The quotas at the time in the 1920s favored Northern and Western European countries. Surprise. Favors the folks who are writing the laws who are elected into office. So Great Britain, Ireland, and Germany accounted for 70% of all available visas. Immigration from Southern, Central, and Eastern Europe was limited. Italians, not wanted. Polish, not wanted. Completely excluded immigrants from Asia, except for the Philippines. Um, immigration under this act was open to the college educated and or those with special skills, but denied entry was denied disproportionately to Eastern and Southern Europeans and the Japanese. And um, this ended up being in conflict with Roosevelt's Gentleman's Agreement. Um, but this was the new law of the land. And um, all these things I'm talking about, um, literacy requirement, residency requirement, certain kinds of groups of people, um, preferred college educated and special skills, that exists today too. All those things have been carried over. Um, our neighbors to the north, Canada, has a points-based system for immigration, um, and they, they only want certain kinds of immigrants. So there's always been, even though it's not been named, immigration is tied to economic needs and growth and labor. And so there's always been that look at it through the lens of the law as time has moved forward. So into World War II, um, heading in, and um, the key thing for me here and, and the thing that I teach a class on is um, what came out of World War II, which is the establishment of international law, which created a framework of humanitarian protection for people who were fleeing persecution. So um, the Geneva Convention came out right after the UN was formed. Oops, I'm going too far fast. Or maybe, oh, um, the three major treaties that came out um, after the emergence and creation of the United Nations were the 1949 Geneva Convention related to the protection of civilian persons in time of war, the 1951 Convention relating to the status of refugees, and uh, later on the 1984 Convention Against Torture. So the status of refugees uh, conference was really the blueprint of international humanitarian law today, which we do adhere to um, with the Refugee Act of 1980. So quick little legal lesson. Um, when the UN was created and all countries decided to sign in, um, then they went through the process of creating a treaty. And for a treaty to be signed, everyone has to ratify or potentially uh, lodge a reservation if they don't agree to certain terms. Um, but it has to be ratified by a majority for it to become international law. And then what is international law? Well, it's kind of toothless in that there's no enforcer of international law. It's just a verbal agreement by nation states that they want to agree to those terms and norms. And so the expectation is once international law is put into place through ratification, that each member's nation state then goes and incorporates it into their own national law. And they can do that however they want to do. They can just say, this is law now, copy paste. Or in the case of the US, we put it through our own process, which goes through the Senate, because um, it's a treaty, international treaty ratification. And so we came out with language that is the Refugee Act of 1980, which created a whole bunch of stuff and is very relevant to the work of the International Institute of Buffalo today. So key piece is the definition of a refugee. Um, any person who is outside of, of such person's nationality of countries or any person who's outside of their home country of their nationality, or in the case of a person not having a nationality, um, the place where they last habitually resided. And key points here, person who is unable or unwilling to return home to that country because of persecution or because of a well-founded fear of persecution on account of race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group or political opinion. So we've got a couple of key things highlighted here. Um, you have to be outside of your homeland. Um, you, have a, you have been persecuted or you fear future persecution. Those are things you have to demonstrate. It's not just you know something you say, you have to actually have proof of it in some way, even if it's just your story. And that your persecution or your fear of it is on account of one of these protected grounds. So on account of, I just did a class today at the law school. It's not just words. What was the, the summary of today's lecture? It's the glue. It's called the nexus. It links the persecution 
to the reason why someone has been persecuted by the government actor, race, religion, nationality, put for membership in a particular social group or political opinion. So those are considered immutable characteristics that someone cannot change about themselves, the color of their skin, the religion they were born into. And um, those are things that our international community has decided um, should be protected. Particular social group, if you're wondering what that means, um, is a catch-all. It's, it's, it's gender, it's tribe, it's uh, women who are being um, persecuted for domestic violence. It's, it's, it's a category that a lawyer can define. Um, and um, it's never been, um, that, that treaty has not been renegotiated because I don't know if today anyone would agree on other categories. So it's the, it's the box you check when you don't have something that fits in the other four boxes. When you're a lawyer and you have to fill out the application and prep your client for trial. So um, that definition in U.S. law has only been amended once in 1996 under IRA-IRA uh, to just add that we recognize that uh, coercive population control is considered past persecution. Um, that's when people were forcibly sterilized. Um, so other than that, the definition has remained the same. Refugees in the post-Cold War era then coming out of the U.N. Accords, the international framework, um, we were looking at a place where there were a lot of refugees post-World War II, and the language of burden sharing came up. Um, whose burden will it be to take on these folks who cannot go home? Um, and while countries tried to figure out who it is they wanted to come in, because this was a new way of trying to figure out how they were going to limit immigration or who they were going to allow in for immigration, um, countries came up with some other means to make it more difficult to reach the soil um, of your country, so in the case of the U.S., and um, to essentially set some limits in place on um, who could potentially ask for asylum. So one of those is passage through a safe third country. Um, that means if when you're fleeing Congo and you end up in Brazil and then you come here, it's going to be looked at as you should have applied for asylum in Brazil. Go back to Brazil. Like you, you passed through a safe third country. This doesn't mean if you're on a plane and like you touch down to refuel, it's more like you like had to be there. Um, but also application time limits. You might've heard some stuff in the news today about um, you have to file for asylum within a one year time frame. Um, disagreeable conditions we've got listed here. I mean, that's, you see refugees living in, in camps, some standard housing zones, um, denying employment authorization. Uh, that's been a very topical matter that's been discussed. Um, detaining folks, no social services, limiting family reunion, et cetera. There are, and, and not all these are adopted by the U.S., but um, various countries have been employed all of those means as they look at trying to figure out refugee flow as migration and who they want in. Um, refugee processes, just a quick hit on it there. As you can see on the screen, there's, there's a very long established set of things that countries need to configure out how they would handle if they're going to let people in and how they would handle it. The U.S. today has sort of two main vehicles for taking in refugees through the formal legal, legal structure, one of which is resettlement. That's what I talked about the Institute does. You go through the formal process, which is called USRAP, the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program. Um, it's administered by the State Department. Um, it starts usually with a refugee in a camp that's outside of their nation where they grew up. And they go through an interview and process. And so when, and they sometimes wait, if you meet somebody in Buffalo today that's a refugee, you know, somebody from Congo might have waited four to five years. Somebody from Burma might have waited 10 to 20 years. Um, you know, Syrians are averaging a wait time of like three to five years. Afghans are looking at two years. That's various reasons for all of that. I can answer questions if you're curious, but nobody just goes to a camp and like six months later is on a plane to the U.S. It does not work that way. Um, but when you enter through that program, you're entering, you're entering with your new life started. You have refugee status, which means you're allowed to work. You are, you're hooked up with an organization like ours, and we wait, we welcome you at the airport, and you're entitled to public benefits, and we will file paperwork to get your family members here, certain family members. But um, you have a lot of supports in place. That is different from people who did not go through that process, possibly because they couldn't who show up here on U.S. soil and they ask for asylum. That means that they're beginning their process here 
And it's, a, I talked about the weight in the camp. Well, their weight is here on U.S. soil. And so there is no employment authorization upon entry. They have to wait a minimum of six months, if not really longer. Um, there is no lawyer provided. They might get lucky and get a free legal aid attorney like me, but that's luck. That's not provided by the government. There is no social services support. There is no um, welfare eligibility and um, family reunification will not happen. So when you meet a single man who's an asylum seeker who left his wife and kids, he's looking at three, four years, maybe longer till he could even file paperwork for his wife and kids, which is often heartbreaking and people have a lot of mental anguish about that. Um, this graphic just shows the resettlement process. So you can see there's a lot of steps. I mentioned, you know, the long wait in the camp. Well, there's a lot of boxes to go through before you're granted. Um, I'm going to pause on this just for a minute about the, the current bill today in case I'm guessing there might be topical questions about it. But in short summary, the president was trying to put through an, a major immigration overhaul and it hasn't happened yet. Um, so if you look at TR's time um, compared to, you know, today, if you look there, we've got it highlighted in 1900 and 1910, you know, the percentage of immigrants who come in, we're around 13, 14%. And if you compare it to today's census, it's still 13, 14%. Um, I mean, obviously there's far more people here now than there were then, but it's still, that's, we kind of, you know, managed to be around the same, um, which is just interesting. Um, there is a record number of foreign born people living in the US today, 46 million people. Um, I mean, that's, we're a global country and um, it's good for us because this is a labor supply that is filling jobs. Um, anybody who runs a business right now is probably having a hard time hiring. I am. We have openings. Let me know if you know people who are looking to work. It's been very hard to hire. All the employers in Buffalo are constantly calling us asking about, um, do you have people coming in? How many people are coming in? I was told that there are over 30,000 manufacturing jobs open in the Western New York area that they cannot find skilled workers to do. Businesses are making choices to run first and second shift and not third shift because they don't have enough people to do it. Um, so, you know, there is a there is a positive thing with people coming in who are willing to work hard, especially those who had that right taken away from them because they had to sit in a camp or their country where they're from wouldn't let them work, wouldn't let them own a home, um, wouldn't let their kids go to school because of the color of their skin. So New York has been benefiting greatly from this. Um, this. This graphic is a few years old, but you can see, I mean, the data is still the same. New York is in the top three of resettlement for the nation. And that's been that way for the last 20 years. And when I say resettlement, I'm talking about refugees coming in through the program, the U.S. State Department program. And I'm talking about Buffalo. Buffalo is the biggest receiver, receiver of resettlement refugees. Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, Utica, Albany, not New York City. New York City has a lot of immigrants, foreign born people from all over, but they're not refugees coming into the program. So the resettlement pipeline is coming in and it's revitalizing cities like Buffalo. And we are actually fielding calls. Um, we did a series of talks last year with Johnstown, Pennsylvania, because they've got open jobs and they don't know how to fill them. And they wanted to know how they could do resettlement. I just did a call last week with um, a place in Illinois, Decatur, they also want to know how can they get people coming in. Um, so you know, there's a recognition that this may be this may be a way for a country or for a community to revitalize. And so I bring that up because we do have an immigrant flow coming in that's not the refugee flow, and that's the asylum seeker flow, which is now fraught with more problems um, because they're asking for permission to stay, and they've got to go through a very long legal process before that decision is made. So. The irony in the asylum statute is that it is literally the same definition I just went through with you, like the little mini law school, the persecution, well-founded fear on account of protected ground that you're judged by the same text. The difference is in how you're making that request and who is adjudicating it and where you make the request. So if you're making it at a port of entry, like you cross the border, land border or at, a, at an airport, or if you come in uh, what is referred to as illegal or unauthorized or undocumented folks who come in and then they at some later point get encountered by immigration and make that request, then the court process begins. And so in today's news, we are, um, in the last year, we've seen a lot of news about migrants from the southern border being shipped up north. 
Um, New York City ended up with over 100,000 asylum seekers and the city's homeless shelter capacity was overwhelmed. And so they then looked to offload and they uh, redirected folks and sent them to cities like Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse. And so today we actually have about 550 asylum seekers living in three hotels locally, and they are going through that process and waiting. And um, it is paid for by New York City, but really New York State taxpayer dollars. Um, it That process um, was a very unfortunate and harmful and hurtful process. People were confused. They didn't know why they were being sent places. Um, I mean, it's there's a concern of human trafficking that could happen as people are confused and don't get supports. Um, it's just not a humanitarian way to look at these things. And um, some of this has resulted be, due to inaction by the federal government to address the border and the policies at the border. But some of it also was a political stunt by folks um, in the southern states to send people up north. Um, but it's been um, a constant recurring theme. Um, the inaction of the federal government has um, resulted in the state, New York state, as well as other states, trying to figure out ways to address it. Um, and um, it's certainly a political factor in upcoming elections. Um, the asylum process, I mentioned it's lengthy. What does that mean? Well, it's 12 months long. Well, sorry, you have to apply within 12 months um, of arrival. Um, depending on your posture, you could you could get a hearing within one years to five years. It depends on how overwhelmed the judge's docket is in the city that you're in. Um, you have to wait until you've lodged your asylum application for, it's 150 days before you can then apply for a work permit. It's actually 180 days before, 180 days before they would approve the work permit. And reality is the thing won't get mailed to you for like probably a year. So that's a long time where in which you're expected to not work and figure out how to feed your family. Um, and there's been part of Biden's proposal for the border and involved looking at redoing that system to not make it because the hardship was then paced, passed on in New York City and other cities that were hosting these folks. Um, so it, none of these things are easy. Um, it's a long application. It's in English. The questions are difficult. It's you should have a lawyer. Um, it's, it's a very difficult thing to win. The grant rates are low for asylum. They're, you know, under uh, 40%, um, depending on the setting you're in without a lawyer, the uh, approval rate goes down to like 25%. It's most people aren't going to be granted it unless they have somebody help them articulate their claim. Um, this is just talking about the kinds of immigrants um, and foreign born folks we have coming into Western New York in the last 20 years. Um, there have been flows of Ukrainians and Afghans coming in that have also come in not through the regular refugee process, but also not through the asylum process. They've been brought in um, as a political diplomatic solution called humanitarian parole, uh, which means it's temporary, parole is temporary, and they need to either return home at some point uh, when their parole runs out or they need to um, formalize their their stay here through applying for asylum. So we have um, we have a lot going on in our city. There's so many different people, lots in need of help. Everybody wants to work that I talk to, but whether or not they're allowed to work is a different question. 10% of Buffalo is foreign born today. 10%. 7% of Erie County is. Um, there's just so many people here and it's really bringing a lot of vitality to the region. And so when you hear these arguments about they take jobs from people, they're a drain on benefits. Um, my hope from today is that you can see that, you know, they're not actually getting public benefits and they really do want to work. And there's a lot of open jobs that I'd be happy to hire anybody for, but um, I'm not getting a lot of applicants. So um, there are reasons to care about immigration today that I think existed even during Teddy Roosevelt's days. Um, it was a time when America was prosperous, when Teddy Roosevelt was president, and there's um, at least a resurgence going on in post-industrial towns like Buffalo, where we are benefiting from people coming here, um, from new communities. You can go and dine around the world on the west side. You can go get Yemeni food, Eritrean food, Somali food, Congolese food. You can go buy products and wares made from those countries. Um, immigrants are paying tons in taxes in Western New York. Um, you know, there's over, where's my slide? Over 3,000 um, immigrant entrepreneurs um, in our region. Some of them have even won like the 43 North competition. Um, you know, there's a ton of spending power and folks that are coming in. So there's a major economic impact 
that um, that is coming in due to people who want to be here, who want to make this their forever home. So in closing, um, I will, I'm open to taking questions. Um, I would say that if you're interested at all in the Institute and about like getting involved with people who are foreign born, who have, you know, had a journey to come here, you can donate goods, you can donate your time, you can volunteer, you can set up an apartment, you can donate money. I'm always happy to get money. Um, you know, there's all these different things that you can do to help welcome newcomers who are going to be Americans soon. And this site here actually takes part in it because we have naturalization ceremonies here periodically, which is a fun thing to come and see because it's people who went through so much to get to a place that's willing to call us and them home forever. So in closing, thank you so much for your time to talk about this. Um, I'll open it up to questions and if anyone has any.